This video lecture is entitled Empirical Judgments and Ethical Decisions. This video lecture is for the course Christian Worldview and Biblical Decision Making at the East Asia School of Theology. Ethics are controversial for a reason. They not only involve the proper use of ancient authoritative materials like the Bible to find ethical resources which can be brought to bear upon the issues we are struggling to respond to today, they also require interpretive judgment to be passed on all kinds of factual data. This is harder than you might initially think. We tend to see data from a certain grid and point of view, that is, a worldview, which tends to incline us towards certain directions when trying to discern ethical directions and make moral judgments. To understand why this is the case, we need to first recognize how people use raw data in their everyday lives and how that deeply influences and impacts ethical discernment and choices. The, the fact is, we all selectively notice and use the raw facts that are presented to us. This is partly a survival mechanism to prevent us from being overwhelmed by sensory data coming in through our five senses. But it is also something that happens based on certain factors that we'll look a little, that we will look at a little more closely below. This is quite new, this is quite true in news reports too, because no news broadcaster can report on everything that happens. Therefore, news editors have to decide on which news stories are important and which ones are not so important. And news editors decide which news stories are important based on their worldviews. In the same way, we as individuals choose which information is important to pay attention to and which things are less important. For example, if you live in a city, you may pay less attention to the weather than someone who lives on a farm and relies on good weather to bring in a good harvest. We also need to be aware that two or more people can examine the same data and come to very different interpretations, including the significance and meaning of that data. We will explore more about why this is the case later when we look at some of the factors that influence how we make empirical judgment. But for now, let's look at this example. We have three pictures. They're identical pictures of the identical man with ball with no hair. Okay, so this is all three pictures are of a bald man. But when you look at a bald man, what do you think of? Do you think he is a soldier? Do you think that person that man is a neo-Nazi agitator? Or do you think he's a cancer survivor? So this example shows us how we can look, how different people can look at the same information, the same data, and come to radically different conclusions. We also need to be aware that people's interpretive impressions of a situation will often determine how they ultimately assess the moral nature and propriety of any given action or set of actions, okay? If people have a certain impression of something, 
very often no amount of argumentation can convince them to change their mind. For example, if a person gets a certain impression about the morality of a pastor drinking alcohol in public, they will very likely interpret the moral status of a pastor based on this particular action in a very specific direction. For example, in England and other parts of Europe, it's very acceptable for pastors to drink alcohol in public. But in the US, in many Christian denominations, it is very unacceptable for a pastor to drink alcohol in public. And so this is an example of what I'm talking about. How we feel about such things will often significantly influence the moral judgments we make about them. This is the kernel of truth in emotivism or the, the role that emotions play. So let me give you three examples to illustrate what I'm talking about. The first example would be war. Almost everyone agrees that war is an ugly thing, but Christians differ markedly with one another about whether or not Christians could ever legitimately and morally participate in or support a nation going to war. Very often, the differing camps of pacifism, just war, and holy war all have the same sets of data, but they come to radically different moral positions based on several other issues that must be examined and considered. Another example would be environmental issues. This is a great example of just how difficult it can be in the contemporary era to make simple interpretation of massively complex sets of data. Is the planet getting warmer? And if so, why? Who, if anyone, is to blame? What can and should be done about it, if anything? How serious is the problem? And how environmentally resilient is our planet? And a third issue that illustrates this situation is the question of poverty and economic justice. While almost everyone can agree poverty is a major problem, applying justice in poverty-stricken situations is far more controversial, and it is difficult to come to any kind of consensus concerning it. Should we just hand out money? Should we feed those who will not work? Should we provide training programs to empower the poor to find jobs? Should we provide mental health care? Should we take on the vast economic systems and powers that create the conditions that lead to widespread poverty and injustice? Should we levy heavy taxes on the rich and give their money to the poor? These are so. These three examples that we've looked at, war, environmental issues, and poverty and economic justice, illustrate the broader principle. There are many, many other issues in which people see the same problems and have the same factual data, but can come to very different conclusions because of how they interpret the information they're given. So let's look at some key factors that influence ethical judgments. Given the obvious fact that good-hearted, biblically-minded, and godly Christians still often come to very different perspectives on many contemporary issues, how can we explain the disparity here? The following four factors go a long way to helping us explain why even Christians can look at the same data and come to very different conclusions about which ethical pathway to take 
in light of those data. The first factor is social mores. These are often unspoken traditions and expectations of propriety or proper behavior in societies that determine how people view certain events and sets of data. They are often non-rational and simply assumed to be what is normal. They do change, but usually only slowly and with much resistance. They tend to be expressed as values. So, for example, in America, freedom and having a strong sense of personal independence are considered rights and a normal part of growing into maturity. In other societies, social responsibility and accountability to the community are far more important. Someone who desires freedom and independence would not only be considered foolish, but perhaps even dangerous and evil because he or she endangers the well-being of the group. In America, such group-oriented values would likely be deemed by the majority of psychologists and social analysts to be abnormal, stifling, and oppressive. So we can see how um, this can cause Christians from different parts of the world to view the same set of the same kinds of behaviors in very different ways. We also have ideologies. These are essentially mental frameworks that are used to filter and interpret data. They provide the rational and emotional grids through which information is passed before it is morally expressed as good, evil, or neutral. Ideologies tend to be explicit and simplistic in their orientation, seeking to explain the world using a relatively limited set of lenses from which data is sorted and evaluated. As such, they usually end up distorting the facts as they are and care little about paying attention to aspects of the data, which doesn't seem to fit very well in the framework from which they are operating. A good example of this is Marxist social theory with its reductionist explanations of economics, classism, and the goals of a good society. But Christians are not exempt here and tend to choose ideological commitments that are less scripturally derived and more culturally based than they often care to admit. So this is something we need to guard ourselves against. There's also the question of vested interests. These are things that bring benefit to those who hold them. They may be associated with ideologies, but not necessarily so. Vested interests are basically ways in which people gain what they perceive as advantages for themselves in terms of economics, power, convenience, and things such as these. An example can be found in the attitude some American Christians had towards slavery in the late 19th century. Many of them argued for the moral and biblical legitimacy of slavery because they themselves were slave owners. So they had a vested interest in continuing the so-called peculiar institution of slavery. Another example might be related to the war debate. Some Christians may be pacifists, at least in part because they are afraid to die in war. On the other hand, some Christians might be in favor of war because they like to shoot guns and they like to feel like heroes. So these are some vested interests that might come up 
uh, that might influence how we respond to the question of war and peace. There's also the question of personal dispositions. As surprising as, as it may seem to some, personalities and dispositions play an important role in the way we see and live in the world. Some people are conformist and tend to seek to conserve certain values. Others are rebels and tend to be more interested in reforming and changing values and norms. Some are positive and easygoing by nature, while others are more cautious and negative. And we can go on and on. Some people um, like new experiences. Other people prefer what is tried and true. So personal disposition can influence us. And because of this, some people are much more likely to embrace ethical scenarios that promote change, whereas others will look to ethical judgment that provides stability and promote the status quo. So here are some possible responses to the reality of differing empirical judgments, because as we've seen, People can look at the same set of information, the same situation, and come to radically different conclusions, even among Christians. So how, how can we respond to this reality? Well, one possible response is moral cynicism. One relatively extreme response to the fact that we can all see the same data and interpret it in radically different ways is to become a moral cynic. Here, the idea is that we cannot really have any access to reality, so we cannot really come together on any moral decisions. We are left with power plays and skepticism, but not any real or useful moral knowledge of our world. So that's one possible response. Another possible response is oral relativism. And this is close, closely related to moral cynicism. Um, and this is a post is, and so moral relativism is postmodern relativity that says that all reality is socially and individually constructed in such a way that all moral judgment are nothing more than power plays and deceptions aimed at enabling some to rule over others. Morality is conventional, but not transcendent or grounded in anything outside of human experience and knowing. So we have this comic from Calvin and Hobbes that illustrates moral relativism. Uh, Calvin says, I don't believe in ethics anymore. As far as I'm concerned, the end justify the means. Get what you want, get what you can while the getting's good. That's what I say, might makes right. The winners write the history books. It's a dog eat dog world. So I'll do whatever I have to do, whatever I have to, and let others argue about whether it's right or not. Boom. Hey, why'd you do that? You were in my way. Now, now you're not. The end justify the means. I didn't mean for everyone, you don't, just me. Ah. So this illustrate this comic illustrates moral relativism. And then a third approach we can take to the reality of differing empirical judgment is critical, is Christian realism. This view understands that reality is influenced by the four aspects we mentioned earlier, but they are not determinative of reality, and reality also independently impacts 
and influences our perceptions and judgments in such a way that we have real but revisable knowledge of the world. This provides Christians with the place for humility and revision, but also recognizes the reality of a non-constructed world out there that is made by God, who has given us a limited but real capacity to access the reality, this reality, and to seek truth and goodness within it, within it, with passion, humility, and integrity to the glory of God. We've come to the end of this video lecture. So if you have any questions you want to ask about this lecture, please bring your questions to our next class session. And I look forward to seeing you in our next class session as we discuss um, how um, empirical judgment affect decision-making. <laughs>